Hello, and welcome to the American Subcontractors Association Women in Construction podcast. This podcast is part one of a two-part series highlighting and celebrating Women in Construction Week nationally. Women in Construction Week draws attention to women as a vital component of the construction industry and raises awareness of the opportunities available for women in this sector. It was also created to emphasize the expanding role of women in construction. The first Women in Construction Week was established in 1960 in Amarillo, Texas. My name is Shannon Oscar, and I serve as the Managing Director of Task Forces for the American Subcontractors Association. And as a fitting start to the first Women in Construction Week in Texas, today we are talking to Texas construction law litigator Bethany Beck. Bethany is a partner at Sandiford & Carroll in San Antonio, Texas, She also serves as our ASA Attorney's Council Chair, where she helps to coordinate our national efforts on behalf of the subcontractor community. Bethany, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here with y'all. Bethany, as you know, women only comprise 10.3% of the construction industry, and even smaller is the number of women on the front lines. Only one of every 100 employees are in the field. As one of the first female chairs of the uh, of the ASA Attorneys Council, how do you see the challenges and opportunities faced by women in the construction industry, whether that's on the side in the field, in the contract law arena, or any other aspect of the industry? So um, I like the way that your question juxtaposes the, the challenges, but also the opportunities, because I've had a really positive experience, uh, both in a construction field that's predominantly male dominated as well as in the legal field especially with litigators that's predominantly male dominated and perhaps that's a lot of good luck um but i thought i would share just you know from my own experience in terms of challenges i think women are sometimes taught to be certain things and they are also sometimes expected to be certain things. And and more often than not, it, it's gonna fall within the categories of being sweet, being nice, being quiet, being small, not taking up a lot of space. Brene Brown has some fantastic books about the way men are socialized to take up space and, and present themselves you know, as a presence in a room and women not so much. And it's not, um, I don't think the challenge is that you should try to be something that's one way or another. I think rather than what maybe is expected of you, the way I feel women will get ahead the most is by being themselves. So if they are naturally, you know, a sweet, nice, quiet person, they should they should do that and they will flourish. But if if maybe that isn't their natural predisposition, um, don't fight it try to fit, you know, a square peg into a round hole. Right. In terms of opportunities, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Shannon. No, I was just agreeing with you. (laughs) Um, So regarding opportunities, I had, I had two things that I always tell, you know, when we hire young lawyers, one is find a good mentor. And it doesn't have to be a, a female, it can be male, female, you know, near your age, far from your age. Um, whatever's a good fit for you. And then the other thing that I really like to tell folks is, and I I did go to the University of Texas at Austin, is come early, be loud, stay late, and you get bonus points if you wear orange. (laughs) But um, (laughs) I had a professor during my last year of law school, he gives kind of a last lecture where he talks about, you know, if the office opens at nine, you be there at seven. Um, And every generation, just as human nature, is going to think the generation that comes after them doesn't work as hard and is more entitled and everything like that. So I think if you're willing to come early, stay late, and make your presence known, um, the world will be your oyster. There's lots of opportunities. That's great. And And I love your point on mentorship. It's just so important for our current leaders to continue fostering the, the next generation of leaders and bringing up those younger women in the industry. So I appreciate that in, in particular. Could you identify a rose and a thorn about your own experience representing the construction industry? I can. Um, so consistent with being a lawyer that talks too much, I have two examples for each of those. Uh, 
so so first rose this is a really great time to visit about this i sincerely enjoy learning new and different things i know that sounds cheesy but um so i spent the end of last week uh stomping around a super muddy like to the point we were almost stuck several times job site up in middle of nowhere northeast texas inspecting concrete wow. and um it wasn't super glamorous but you know i wasn't sitting around checking my email all day it was a nice change of scenery and more than anything i got to learn so much about the structural design of it and where it can afford to have weaknesses and where it cannot afford to have weaknesses um and that's gonna you know those issues are gonna have a really really big impact on how my client fares in this particular dispute and so it was it was just fantastic to get out there and see this in person and be able to experience it in person so roses are the always learning new trades new projects new everything every case and the second thing would be the people. Um, I have found subcontractors to just be kind, down to earth, hardworking people. Um, I've had many go out of their ways to, you know, as part of that learning process I was just describing to make sure that I really grasp the construction aspects of things and not just the legal aspects of things. And I've always appreciated that. On thorns. Um, I struggled to come up with something that was construction specific initially because the truth is there's good and bad people everywhere and there's um, hard, hard things and positive things about every job any of us will ever have. One thing about, I did think of about construction, I've done a lot of contract reviews this year, um, is I, I always have this sense that back in the good old days, you know, construction was more of a team effort and the GC self performed more and the contracts were perhaps a little bit more even-handed <laughs> and i don't know if it's the lawyers that ruined that but um it is disappointing sometimes to to read these contracts that'll just curl your toes and to, ha to have the briefcase contractor types um so those have been a little bit more of the thorns and then the the second aspect which is a little bit more female specific is I've noticed more, not more often than not, but on enough occasions, I will have a client who perhaps wants to be maybe a little bit condescending or an opposing counsel mm -hmm. in the same way, and then want to tell me how it is. And I hadn't actually even noticed it until um, one of our new associates pointed it out and said, that would drive me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and and the thing is, um, something that's helpful to me in this context, but also in the real world, is thinking about things from somebody else's perspective. So when a client comes to me, they are personally and professionally um, in such a hard place that they are going out and spending their hard-earned money on a lawyer to try to get them out of that place. Right. And and that's. If you can keep things like that in mind, it just it never it never phases me because I know that they're not upset at me. Um, they're upset that they're having to talk to me at all. Right. <laughs> so, perspective can be really helpful sometimes. Well, that's a good that's a good outlook on it. Just to to recognize what what kind of uh, kind of experience they're they're walking into that that meeting with that could help explain behavior that they otherwise might not exhibit. How important do you see building a diverse and inclusive construction workforce is? I think um, diversity and inclusivity are always good things that every entity or organization can and should uh, strive to achieve. More than anything though, where I think new people or young people or females can and break into the construction workforce is I'm always, always, always hearing from my clients that they're having a really hard time finding enough skilled labor. Mm. So I, I think the interesting thing there is skill. If you can develop and perfect a skill, you can be from whatever background, 
um, in terms of race or gender or affluence or education, um, if you have a valuable skill, and by way of example, you know, we're down here in Texas and two weeks ago, if you were a plumber, probably still now, <laughs> you're a plumber, uh, your skill is in high demand right now. Um, so I, I think having those, those important job site skills can get you far. Absolutely. There are several factors, I think, that explain the gender gap in the construction industry whether it's unconscious gender bias to the lack of adequate tra training to overall perception of women in construction. However, despite these barriers, we continue to see women build their path in the industry. As a female partner in a construction law firm, which one resonates with you most? So um, in, term in terms of the barriers, the concept that I wanted to point out, which I probably hate to admit, I think it came from Oprah, <laughs> uh, is the idea that you teach people how to treat you. Hmm. So instead of focusing on a, a particular barrier, if you want to focus on the path in the industry and what it is that you want to achieve, you can teach people how to treat you in a way that's going to get you there. And so Typically, what I like to see is I like to see go-getters who don't wait to be asked to do something, but who are able to observe and learn what's going on around them and say, hey, it looks like this thing over here could be done. Can I help with that? I'd like to make things easier for you. Mm -hmm. um, I think every manager or boss in the world, if, if an employee comes along and makes their life easier, you know, that person is is going to be retained. They're going to make great efforts to retain people who make their lives easier. And then I know it's become trendy lately. I, I forget how the phrase goes, but something along the lines of nevertheless, she persisted. And I like the concept of persistence. And so I thought I would, I would close off that particular concept with one of my favorite quotes from my own mentor. Um, who, when he's really stuck on a case or an issue or whatever, he almost says out loud to it, he says, I'm just going to follow you around like a bad smell. Uh, I like it. And I've always, I've always liked that because you get the, I, you can kind of visualize and get the idea of, you know, this, this person is going to be here and stick it out through thick and thin. They're not going anywhere because they're going to be here like a bad smell. <laughs> I like it very much. Well, thank you, Bethany, for your your wisdom, your insight, your experience on on this important topic, and for taking the time to talk to us today. We here at ASA are excited for the leadership roles that that we see you and so many others taking nationally in the subcontractor community. And we want to thank everyone at home for listening today. We hope you'll join us for our next Women in Construction podcast featuring ASA subcontractor and president of the Women Construction Owners and Executives, Sheila Orenberg and Dana Thompson, who is the national representative for the Women Construction Owners and Executives in Washington, D.C. We look forward to connecting with you again for our next podcast. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>